Dr. Power, you guests have arrived. Thanks, Bonnie Castle. Hi, folks. Come in. There's room for two more over here. Well, I got my grandson, Sean, with me today. It's his 17th, 18th month old birthday, so uh, 18 months is quite a feat. Last time I had him here, uh, he was much younger, and I picked him up with my little arthritic hands and passed him to my wife, and in the process of passing, I almost dropped him. But uh, I thought I'd share with uh, my grandson with shush. That's the sign for shush. That means we don't tell mom what we're doing, right? This is our secret. And Papa keeps what? Little pieces of chocolate. Oh. Shh. Shh. Right. And I don't like that hat. In fact, we'll have a vote. We like the hat with or without the hat. Anyway, that's my grandson. Let's get to work if we can. Well, there you are. He's, he's gone now, but... Uh, Certainly kids bring an awful lot of sunshine into your life, particularly at my age, but they can take it out just as fast as they get ill, and unfortunately I imagine many of you know that. Uh, anyway, this is video for week seven, uh, just uh, one more session after this and we're, we're through the hunt. I hope you've picked some things up. We've moved rather quickly in, uh, in eight sessions to dump as much material as we've dumped on you, but I uh, hope you've changed the conversations around the water cooler, as I say, and at, uh, at the dining room table that you're starting to think a little differently like a strategist. And that's practice, it's just keep on doing it after you leave us. Uh, you can do this. Uh, the discussion sites are going well. Uh, people are meeting the expectations. Um, two posts a week, that's all. Don't be overwhelmed. Many are, particularly with the accounting side of the house and all the requirements there. So uh, uh, I'm happy just with the, the bare minimum to get through the course. You can do that. But on the other hand, I commend those who find the time. They're just marvelous, intelligent, intellectually capital coming in that we're sharing with people. We're all learning and raising the general awareness on so many issues among all of us. And as MBA students, as MBA graduates, as strategists, we need to have that sense of awareness of what's going on, and the discussion sites are doing that in, in, in spades for us. Um, I apologize, I had an email in from, from one of our colleagues about the, the misalignment in the, in the podcasts and the uh, videos that I make between that and the page numbers in the text, and I, I have to apologize for that. It, it's completely my issue, but I was faced with a challenge that if I had, when you take some other online courses, you know what I'm getting at, this is a very rich course in the sense a lot of effort goes into it, production goes into it, separate videos are made and integrated into it, podcasts are made, uh, transcripts are made, and uh, we can either do that or we can cut pieces out of it and make it a far more simple process uh, and do that and get the page numbers right. But every 18 months, they change the textbook on me, but substantially the materials haven't changed since, since the fifth edition when I started using this text. It's a fabulous text. It's a it's a research text you can keep on your shelf at work or home, and you want to know something, look in the index, you'll find a good aid to memoir checklist. Um, but 50% of the materials are mine, uh, the cases are mine, etc. And uh, other than your exam case, the individual case, you really don't need this particular issue edition of the text. You can get by with the, the last iteration or the iteration before that if you prepare to take time to look in the index and find that context that you're looking for. So I say I apologize for that, but it was a decision I made, and Hopefully it's the right, the right decision. Uh, we have uh, second assignments, we're already back. I was generally pleased with the marks. The grades are at the B plus, uh, A minus, and a, a few A's in there. I was pleased with that. Um, but the new ones arrived. Assignment three are just coming in on, uh, this is uh, for Monday, it's coming in last night. And so uh, I haven't opened up, but I will be opening them up on, on Monday. Uh, 80 students, an hour each, lengthy feedback. You can do the math. It's going to keep us pretty busy for the next two weeks to get them back to you in time for the exam. We want you to have them for the exam so you can get a sense of what it would look like for your exam paper. And speaking of exam, it'll be a closed book. Uh, I'll give you the actual cases I've explained, I think, last week or the week before. On a week from this coming Monday, you'll know what the case is. You can talk to your colleagues about it, see what questions pop up, what models you think you might want to use, um, practice ratios if applicable. The point is there's no surprise, that's 50% of the exam. And the other part we've talked about is five of six little short snappers, uh, Sun Tzu quote, Drucker quote, Porter quote, um, maybe a model or something explained, um, something like that, but you'll have no, no difficulty with the exam. Um, this week we talk a bit about the McLean Group, uh, the uh, uh, succession planning, um, corporate governance, values, much like the Peter Thomas video that many commented on and liked in uh, the last session. Um, I encourage you to look at that. Uh, we cover a bit of P3s, um, CSR, and one of the problems with CSR and doing the right thing when, when, an, in, when an injury takes place, um, like the United Airlines, we have a problem because at, at Canadian law, American law, Anglo-Saxon law, when you talk with lawyers, the first thing we'll tell you is 
not to say you're responsible. You can have an accident, you can hit a little old lady across the street, she can slide 20 feet across the sidewalk, you still can't get out and say, I'm sorry, even if you drove through the light, because that'll come back to bite when time comes for discovery or uh, on examination at trial. Um, that admission of guilt goes a long way to uh, helping the other side, and insurance companies have in their clauses that you can't admit liability without their lawyers guiding you through the piece. So it's, it's unfortunate that uh, that's our system, that even though internally our internal compass says do the right thing, um, we've got these lawyers banging on our heads saying, uh, be careful, you're going to cost us money. So that's a challenge we face. Our uh, finance uh, minister, uh, uh, Sarjan, uh, about out of a fundraising event um, held for veterans for Afghanistan, uh, I was scheduled to speak to Stan and back on Tuesday, uh, but he had a scheduling conflict and couldn't attend. And of course, most of you know he's under fire for enhancing his, uh, his involvement in the key battle with the Canadian forces in Afghanistan in 2006. And uh, that goes on a little further that the Conservative leader, Rona Ambrose, is pushing hard and indeed has put a non-binding motion forward uh, calling for him to stand down as our Defence Minister, uh, sort of a lack of confidence in him. So uh, an issue to walk, watch these days is never good for uh, government uh, when ministers have to step down, but it's an issue we can watch. The, TP, the TPP, we've heard much about uh, um, our, our friend uh, Donald Trump in the, in the States uh, withdrawing from the TPP, this arrangement with the, uh, with, uh, the Pacific Rim countries. Um, but Canada is still quietly and secretly holding meetings on that. Uh, well, initially, we thought it was a death knell that we wouldn't be involved in the TPP. But there's some evidence coming out there, a meeting still going on, that Canada may proceed with these 12 countries around the Pacific Rim and put some sort of agreement together without America, um, which is interesting. Um, I mean, the ripples from that, we can go on and, and think about it, the idea that how pleasant and how pleased will, uh, uh, Prime, will President Trump feel about uh, Canada doing that? Is it some sort of a... Uh, um, out of step with Americans' uh, policies may, may be an issue. Um, it's certainly something Canada needs in order to decouple from the economic interdependence with America. We need more partners, uh, rather than be 70%. So we can watch for that uh, is going on. Um, Hamas, yeah, Hamas. Uh, today, Abbas, um, um, from the other side, uh, sitting up north uh, with the Palestinian uh, authority up there. Um, he's had a meeting with Trump just today, and uh, talking in terms, it's, they're both, both positions regarding, let me just set the stage for a second, up, up north in the Gaza area, not in the Gaza, but in the, up around the West Bank area, uh, we have the uh, folks up there with, with Abbas, um, that side of the house, and they're kind of landlocked over here, Israel's here, Mediterranean's here, one port down here in the Gaza, and a train line runs, and supply lines runs from there all the way up this way, up into the West Bank area, but you've got to go through Israeli checkpoints to get your rations, your supplies from the Mediterranean, and Israel has often just stopped the traffic so they can influence the supply of food and water and oil, some things going up. And uh, down south, of course, in the Gaza, we have uh, um, the, uh, the Hamas sitting down there, um, and uh, for the first time, they seem to be, have published a paper as uh, they're changing leadership down south, uh, saying that they might be open for a two-state solution. And that's the first time. And Trump today uh, said something interesting, that he's prepared to act as a facilitator. I mean, America by itself should not be so foolish as he did in the Belfort Agreement and say, I'm going to redraw the lines. That would never work. Let the tribes do it along tribal lines. But uh, to America's credit, to uh, his credit, he's prepared to get involved in the sense of arbitrator, facilitator, but uh, not arbitrarily saying this will be the law. Uh, but there does seem to be some movement by both of the uh, Palestinian Authority and by the Hamas down south that uh, something might be possible for peace between the Israelis and these folks and some settlement of the land and issues on the West Bank and seizing the West Bank lands. So we'll watch for that. It's, it's interesting to see it's coming out. Um, the growth in Europe is speeding up. I was pleased to see that. Uh, for the first quarter, uh, they got up to 0.5 at 1 percent in three months. And if that's extended out, that means a 2% GMP for Europe. Uh, that's good. They were forecasting about a 0 0.8, less than 1%. And so that's a, a good increase. Uh, eradicating poverty, there's a slowdown. In 1981, there were just under 2 billion people, just over 2 billion, just under 2 billion people, but 42% of the world's population in 1981 lived on less than $1.90 a day in purchasing power parity. 
uh, in 213, uh, this number had fallen uh, to about uh, 767 million, quite a drop. Um, and the nice thing to hear is that China has done most of this, this uh, elevating the poor up. So China really has very few paupers left. Uh, mostly these are found in, in Arab states and in uh, African states. And it's going to take a little longer to get the rest of these folks up. Uh, we have the uh, new missile defense that America is working on with uh, Korea, with this conflict going on with Kim Jong-un. And uh, uh, America is moving quickly. Trump suggested to South Korea that they should pay $1.1 trillion for this. This is this industrial military complex. It's the industrial uh, sales of arms we talked about last year, last week between Canada, China, and uh, not Canada, but uh, America, Russia, and China are the leaders in selling industrial wares around the world. And this is one good example of selling a 1.1 billion missile defense plan uh, to face off with uh, North Korea. Um, so we watch for that. A little thing on heart uh, rate apps. Uh, they said most aren't accurate, so be careful on these little apps you get and put your finger on and it checks your heart rate. Today in the paper we have uh, things to talk about. It's a full paper. It's amazing. Uh, the Times columnist doesn't normally have that much. But first thing that popped my mind was first the, the symptom is BC Liberal Stephen Roberts uh, has a cottage on Salt Spring and wants to build a hundred, was a hundred foot, I think a hundred foot uh, lap pool, um, which is rather nice, uh, and it's one of these uh, um, no wall things, uh, infinity as I guess they're called, wants to put it up. But the issue is he wants to build it on um, First Nations land where there are ancient sites that they fear there's some sort of a uh, burial grounds for the First Nations, and so there's a bun fight going on for that, but it led me to do some little more research and put this question to you for this week, is that currently there's uh, 1.4 million, um, about 4% of the Canadian population, uh, folks who identify as First Nations to some degree or another. Um, there's only 322,000, 322,000 actually live on reserves uh, that we consider that thing. Um, but yet we have $9 billion a year are expended by that ministry on First Nations, primarily for the 322,000 that are living on reserves. $9 billion year after year after year after year after year. And so I wonder if the time hasn't come for a smarter way to do this, because uh, it, it seems to me we've got to be squandering, wasting money. I did some searches on, on, uh, on income for chiefs, and uh, I didn't look at them all, but I must have looked at least 50 or 60 of them. And I found one fellow that only has 85 members in his band here in BC, 85 members, takes home over $900,000 a year as his annual salary. Pretty nice. But in fairness, most of them, uh, band chiefs, uh, in the $100,000 range, maybe up to 200000 But given the responsibilities, that's not an unusual number. But somewhere this $9 billion is going to be chewed up. And on top of the $9 billion, there are other government departments that also contribute. For example, I found another billion dollars comes from Canada Health, $1.1 billion for things like supplemental dental and things like that. So it's quite a large number. And if you did the math with me and took uh, 322,000 people and 9 or $10 billion year after year after year, couldn't we give them all a million dollars in a trust fund and uh, close down that ministry altogether? Just a thought. Let's talk a bit about that in any event. It's, uh, it's something that uh, caused me some concern. And, and indeed, it's kind of antiquated. They have the Indian Act, and under the old system, First Nations living on reservations, they were never allowed to own a piece of land. And so when we drive by land, it's not painted, it doesn't appear to be cared for. Uh, the band takes care and owns the property. And if you own the property yourself, you're more, more inclined to, to plant those trees and shrubs and rose bushes. And, uh, but under the Indian Act, most were prevented from getting mortgages and things on that. And so uh, um, there has been some latitude, some liberation of that. It's starting to happen, but it needs to go faster. I think the whole Indian Act has to be overhauled. In fact, it was interesting to digress for a minute that there was a Peruvian economist. Um, the name will come to me in a minute. But uh, yeah, in any event, he talked about, and it was an aha moment for me, uh, in the sense that if you went to these nations in, in Africa and the nations in South America, um, and like the First Nations here, the Swamoth are living on the finest land in, in, the, in the world, on waterfront and, and on Victoria Island. Uh, the land is worth a barrel of money, but they can't raise mortgages on it. And so they don't need a handout from the IMF in, in South America and places like this. They just need the ability to register the property that's been in their family for generation after generation, and they can raise their own money and put up their own infrastructure and hotels and pay taxes, etc. And uh, it's something that we need to, uh, to consider. 
And I'll come back, my mind will come back to the name of that, that, that fellow in any event. Aftershocks going on here, uh, 6.2 quake in the Yukon, northwest BC. There's over 100 aftershocks taking place in our little area of the world. And uh, not to be alarmed about it, but uh, it does prod the message about earthquake kits and pandemic um, plans for your business. When something like this happens, the hospitals won't be able to accommodate us. Uh, we're going to need to take care of ourselves for a great number of days. And uh, so it doesn't make, it makes sense to look at earthquake kicks and, and uh, some sort of fan out system and some way we can take care of ourselves and be self sufficient for a while. In Victoria, we've got a tent city uh, by the police station long gone, but now a new city is growing up right on the uh, by the Johnson Bridge, again on the waterfront, downtown Victoria, which is a tourist area. But now we have tent city folks uh, sleeping out. What are we going to do? I mean, we've got people who are homeless, and uh, more so with the internet of everything, be more people out of work. And so they need some accommodation. Uh, these people, I'm sure, at one point still had hopes and dreams. And yet we, uh, it says here, we shoo them off at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they bundle their stuff up in some sort of a carriage they've taken from someplace, and then they reassemble at night and um, sleep in the streets for handouts in downtown Victoria in the middle of the tourist area. And so we need to do better, and uh, we need to come up with that guaranteed annual income or some thoughts to uh, take care of these people. We just can't allow that number to grow. WestJet Charter, long-range course. Uh, WestJet uh, doing well. They've just announced the new Boeing uh, 787 Dreamliner. Um, quite a nice machine. allows us to sleep flat as we travel, so they're going to get... But they're expanding their... Their, their lines going international and spending their lines. What are the advantages, and we talk about strategy and things to do, where they got the edge over Air Canada, they bought all the same plane but the same cockpit, and so their pilots only had to be trained in one class of uh, ticket to fly whatever plane they drew that, that day. But Air Canada bought planes from here and planes from there and planes from there, and so the pilots had to be checked out, which gave certain efficiencies to WestJet over... Uh, over uh, Air Canada. So we can look at those sort of in your business. Home sales are sliding in uh, Vancouver. Uh, again, we clearly are going somewhere, this little housing bubble we've got. At some point, it's got to readjust. Um, renewable supply electricity report came out. Two-thirds of Canada's electric supply, two-thirds of our electric supply in all of Canada, uh, comes from renewable sources. Uh, that was interesting. China has 29% uh, of the world's hydropower. But uh, in reading it, but uh, uh, wind power saw the biggest growth in a decade in Canada um, going up. And we're the seventh largest producer in the world of wind power. I guess the message I'm trying to get here is this, this transformational shift in where energy comes from and the need for Alberta oil companies to reposition themselves for this new world that we're entering into. But with all these renewable energies, it, it's happening and moving quickly, moving quickly. Um, Envoy to NAVA, yeah. Envoy tells about NAFTA deal. We have uh, sent down uh, uh, a Canadian MP to uh, speak to a group down in uh, in New York about the benefits of NAFTA and don't be uh, too excited over President Trump's uh, initiative and the dangers involved. It was Andrew Leslie that we sent down. And the Leslie family uh, um, are well known in Canada, um, involved with General Motors and setting it up. McNaughton, you probably know that name. And uh, Andrew Leslie, if it's the same gentleman I'm thinking of, uh, changed his name uh, at one point to McNaughton to get some of the inheritance. But my point is the McNaughton family, the Leslie family, Leslie family are well established as Canadian top 400 families. In any event, he's down there talking to the Americans about the dangers of walking away from NAFTA. And he talks in terms that American, uh, the TD Bank employs uh, uh, tens of thousands of Americans. He talks in terms of TransCanada pipelines uh, going through the thing. He talks about a hamburger, about the processing, and he said that the hamburger gets processed, the meat gets processed uh, in Alberta, uh, correct, the meat gets uh, raised in Alberta, sent down to the states for processing, uh, ends up in a bun baked in California, wheat from Saskatchewan, topped with lettuce from Arizona, and a tomato from Ontario. Uh, my point is the integration between these processes and the danger of NAFTA trying to strip apart certain pieces of it and what it's going to lead to. And so it was a, a, good, a good thought. Um, and the other part of that is uh, the president wants to do this all in six months, uh, negotiate between uh, Mexico, Canada, and come up with a new NAFTA or uh, an alternative to NAFTA, uh, or walk away from it, all in six months. And I think the challenge that our president is faced with, that in business, we move faster. In uh, government, you tend to move slower, more 
checks and balances and studies and reports, etc., all has to go for the danger of bringing the ministry into disrepute. And I don't think Trump is familiar with that that slowness, uh, the, the lethargic sort of move of, of government and slowly like molasses getting to points. And I'm sure it's driving him crazy. He wants this done in six months. Government probably wants to be orchestrated. said it'll probably take a couple of years. So we'll see what happens. Um, modest gains for the European trade with the, the other trade agreement, the CETA agreement that we put in place to uh, comprehensive economic and trade agreement with the Europeans when about two years ago. And they think it's going to benefit all Canadians about $250 worth a gross benefit to us by this trade agreement. Uh, certain sectors will do well. Other sectors, such as uh, farmers and that, are going to do poorly. In fact, we have to subsidize the farmers to offset what we lost in trading with the European Union and their dairy products and cheeses and things. And uh, it seems to me that's going to fly in the face of the NAFTA agreement, because the NAFTA agreement is all about unfair subsidies. And if we're subsidizing the dairy industry to meet the, the requirements of the Europeans in that agreement, NAFTA wants us to strip out the subsidies so it's a level playing field for the Wisconsin uh, dairies and cattle folks. So there's a, there's a challenge going on there, and it's all about, I mean, liberalized trade is about economy of scale. Uh, it's this push for bigness, larger farms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, sometimes that doesn't always work. Cineplex, um, up their quarter profits for diversification. And the lesson for us there is, is that uh, not just a movie studio anymore, but it's uh, it's a, uh, uh, some sort of activity center. They have media, they have food, they have gaming. Uh, one place they've just built a brand new 60,000 square foot gaming space. It's nothing to do with the movie. Just come in there and play the games and have a food, take your day out there for, for, the, for the night. But they've added, they've bundled these extra activities in, and as a result, sales. So the message for us is bundling for your products and services. Is there something you can do that will stimulate your bottom line? Um, Canadian auto sales went down in Alberta in, in April, loss of sales, and uh, um, maybe too early to ask what the so what's, is it in some sense an indicator or a canary in the coal mine for our uh, GMP? Uh, are we slowing down a little bit? So let's watch the Canadian auto sales, that's a big part of our GMP. A pharmacist in Halifax um, received a thousand dollar reprimand, fine, and license suspended for 30 days because she makes... Uh, uh, marijuana cookies and package them and apparently left them out on the counter and other people help themselves. You need a prescription to get them. And uh, again, that's a matter of government controlling, which maybe some of us don't believe should be controlled. Apple's got a big stash of cash, something like $257 billion, quarter of a trillion dollars in cash sitting there and wants to do something with it. I mean, at today's interest rates, it's killing. It should be levered. It's an asset that should be used. Return on investment shouldn't be 1% or 2%. That doesn't even cover inflation. So they have no, no choice. They have to give it back to the shareholders, or they should be investing it with assets. And so they're looking at acquisitions, but part of this is Trump's movement to say, bring your money back into the States. We can buy some assets. We've got a lot sitting here in Canada. Bring it back into the States. We'll charge you 15% income tax to bring it back. But then you've got this pile of cash to spend. And so they're looking at buying things like Disney and a bunch of other companies. And uh, these are big acquisitions and uh, a chance for us to make some money if we can read the tea leaves and see what they're planning on buying. But first, we've got to see the tax thing passed in the states so they can actually bring this cash back to make these purchases. Interesting here, we talk about shareholder activism and drug, drug makers and frustration annual meeting. And Valent uh, Pharmaceuticals in Quebec had their meeting and they got, the board got raked over the coals by shareholders who were very disappointed over the last year or two's performance that the stock was $350 a share and it dropped in August 15th to $10 a share. 350 down to 10. So you can appreciate shareholders buying a pharmacy, a pharmaceutical company thing is reasonably safe, but uh, didn't manage it well, down to came and grumbling taking place. It's starting to move upwards a little bit. It may be a company to watch. But what they have to do, and they're talking about doing it, they're going to try to prune the rose bush and cut $5 billion off the rose bush by selling assets they don't require and start jettisoning stuff that we as CEOs, as strategists, understand. You've got to revisit from time to time what your core function is and look hard at those, those things that really don't contribute to your bottom line and draining the resources. And so they're finally getting around to do that. Um, a sleeping lawyer gets a man a new trial, a defense attorney, <laughs> fell asleep in court, and the judge uh, reprimanded him on it and uh, got a new trial. I enjoy reading those stories. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. What else have we got here? 
Oh, the EU won't suspend. That's interesting. The, the Americans, Trump said that uh, uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Poland, Romania, um, these visa-free travel visas are going to be stopped until we get a handle on this. And Canada went along with Bulgaria and Romania, the same sort of thing. But the EU didn't respond tit for tat. I mean, they had reason to do it, but they said, no, no, we'll carry on uh, uh, the other way around. You can still come in here without any visa restrictions. So uh, a good thing by the European Union, but uh, you talk. Toronto woman and boyfriend strangled in Belize. Um, just a heads up, I guess they went to a pub somewhere down there and something untoward happened. Um, Elizabeth May, a pretty solid individual, uh, uh, talks in terms of calling for repeal of the provision that allows Canada's spy agency to violate the constitutional rights with the judge's permission, uh, and uh, all under the under the Anti-Terrorism Act. And you recall, we followed suit with the Americans in the, in the Patriot Act, and we got this spy versus spy thing going on. And to her credit, she's trying to roll back and give us back some of her civil liberties. And so she's made this motion to uh, not see that enforced, withdraw it. And uh, Trudeau on the other side of it seems to be adamant that he wants to make sure all these things are in place. So it's, it's something we have to look at is how much government we want and how much government we need. Um, Quebec Liberals face a probe into corruption claims. Prosecutor's office there called for a criminal inquiry into corruption against uh, the Quebec Liberal Party. Um, fraud investigation of a formal one sitting Liberal Party member. Um, all of a sudden was told, uh, the Crown was told to stop the charges and freeze everything. And uh, now it's being investigated uh, about political interference by the uh, Liberal Party to stop the process of this act. It's worth watching. And again, the Bentley test, how do you feel it's on the front page of the page? And so had they had the Bentley test, they probably wouldn't have made that decision. Uh, still writing about Obama and Clinton, uh, the idea that uh, certainly Clinton and their trust fund, they were taking money from everybody, uh, but now uh, they're making a the point that ex-president uh, Barrick took $400,000 U.S. from Wall Street uh, for a one-hour speech. And uh, a lot of the folks in the Democratic Party are, are, are shuddering at that. Uh, certainly Senator Elizabeth Warren is really taking them to task. So we looked at that for donations. But we have our own donations here, and, and B.C. Liberals have a bumper crop of donations. In 2016, the B.C. political, uh, that filed their stuff, in 2016, the Liberal Party raised $13.1 million. Um, the uh, N uh, federal NDP got $4.8 million, and the Green Party, of course, uh, uh, less as they went through it. Um, the top people contributing are property developers, um, miners, forestry, oil and gas, and construction. Um, no big surprise there, but when you see all the development going on and the, the waiver of certain things, environmental things, no big surprise because you pay your money, you pay your $1,000 for your seat at your table, and then at least you've got access to the minister. But the question arises, who speaks for us? How do you get into the, prime, into the uh, premier's office and share your concerns? You don't. You've got to buy the seat at the table. And so we can talk about that. Bike lanes, big thing in Victoria. They're we're bike laning everything these days, and it, it's certainly a challenge for those uh, just trying to get around the streets. But uh, we can look at that. Certainly if you're young, you can do bike lanes. You get to be an old fart, it's a challenge. Um, the final thing, I guess, for today is uh, uh, Senator uh, Don Meredith uh, engaged with a sexual relationship, it seems, with a, a teenage girl. And uh, that's an incident. But it, it, it speaks to the larger issue as to the role of the Senate and the role of senators. These are political hacks in large part who were appointed by one party or the other who was ever in power, and uh, they've been raised several times with the idea of voting for senators, where the people have a say in who should be senators. And do we need that second sobering thought anymore? What difference does the Senate make? When was the last time the Senate stopped a piece of legislation? And so uh, it's in our British North America Act as part of our Constitution, but uh, what's the real true value of a senator these days, other than they make some money and keep running afoul of, the, uh, of what the right and wrong thing to do? Well, folks, that's it for today, week seven. I hope you enjoyed this week seven, and just one more to go. Looking forward to next day. Take care now. Bye-bye.